Thank you, Randy. Every time we open our mouth, we're telling a story. And the better storyteller we are, the better communicator we are. Does anybody not accept the fact that success is tied to communication? Everybody buy that? Absolutely. And even sometimes when we're not speaking, we're communicating. This morning when Ed was talking about his wife standing at the window, shaking her head, was she telling a story to Ed? Did he want to hear it? Nope. Let me tell you about a gentleman I work with. Kenny is a fantastic manager. He just turned 40. He's dedicated. He's sharp. He puts in the 12, 16-hour days. He's been to Dale Carnegie. But Kenny just got a new position at the company I work for. And in his first national call with about a couple hundred people, he heard one time that if you tell a joke or a story, it breaks the ice. Well, what Kenny meant to say was, scientists have discovered that women only use half their brain and they're still smarter than men. What came out was, you know, women are only half as smart as men. <laughs> Kenny spent the next 20 minutes trying to recover from that statement. <laughs> Do you think Kenny could have used a little storytelling skills? Absolutely. Let me tell you first how I see storytelling. Everybody complete this sentence. Wax on, wax off, wax off, wax off. When Mr. Miyagi was teaching Daniel-san karate, and he was using his unique methods of washing cars, waxing floors, and painting fences, did Daniel-san know that he was learning karate? Storytelling is that way. The better storyteller you become, the better communicator you become. The better communicator you become, the better storyteller. It just goes on and on and on. The power of storytelling. In 1942, Walt Disney released Bambi. In 1943, does anybody want to take a guess at how much hunting dropped in the United States of America? Anybody? 40% in one year because of a movie. When Martin Luther King Jr. stood on the steps of the uh, Washington Monument, or the Lincoln Monument, excuse me, he was telling a story. It was his vision, but it was still his story, how he saw America, how it should be. 33 years ago, when I got down on one knee and said, Nancy, you're perfect. You're the girl of my dreams. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I promise to be a millionaire by 30. <laughs> I promise always to be a loving husband. Was I telling her a story? <laughs> now wait a minute, you're laughing. But stories range from hard, cold facts. Who remembers Walter Cronkite? And that's the way it was. To the other end of the spectrum, of fable, otherwise known as a BFL, a bald-faced lie. Now in this spectrum of stories, most people don't even realize that they, they gravitate towards one type of story. Mine tend to be the human interest, the Paul Harvey, who remembers Paul Harvey, loved his stories. And yes, to have Paul Harvey call me, one of my childhood heroes, that is a dream come true. But to discover your storytelling style, Randy, would you hand out some flyers for me, that first stack there? Take this stack of papers and list either stories you love or storytellers you love. Write down as many as you can think of. If it's only two or three, that's fine. If it's 10 or 15, that's fine. But write down the people and it can be your grandfather, it could be someone at work, it could be a fellow Toastmaster. But write down those stories or storytellers that you find valuable in your life. And they can be any type of story. They can be romance, uh, technical in nature, the hard news. And as you write those down, you'll start to see a pattern emerge. 
What are my favorite type of stories? And common sense dictates that that's what kind of stories that you also like to tell. Take a couple minutes and write those down. Everybody got at least a handful of them? All right, Brian and Gary, I'm going to ask you to come up here for a minute. No, we're not going to tie you up. Don't worry. Grab one end. I haven't been that excited in a while. <laughs> go, to, go all the way out to the end. I want all of you to picture this as a storyline. At this end, we have the hard, cold news, Walter Cronkite, the facts of the story are. And at this end, we have your run-of-the-mill politician. I mean, fable teller. <laughs> Someone shout out one of, the, one of the stories or storytellers that you wrote down. Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld. So where do you think on this from hard nose to fable, do you put the comedian Jerry Seinfeld? Where, where on here do you put his, his story? Where do you think? Right about, how are we doing? Right about there? A little more right about there? Right about there? All right. Who else? Garrison Keillor. Garrison Keillor. Ooh, that's a good one. Where do we put Garrison Keillor on that? How did I know that? All that stuff really happens in Minnesota. That, I believe. <laughs> you, sir, are a budding bachelor farmer. <laughs> Someone else? Larry the Cable Guy. Larry the Cable Guy. You think Larry the Cable Guy belongs down there? <laughs> Which is different than uh, Jim Carrey, right? <laughs> One more. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Ooh. Because we were leaning towards this end of the. Steve Jobs? How are we looking? Right about there? A little farther this way? Yeah? All right. Now I got one more person to ask. Nancy, that earlier. Uh, but down on my knee about telling the story. I need you to place me on this line somewhere. I'm, so is it this, this way? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when. <laughs> Little more? <laughs> right about there. <laughs> <laughs> Things didn't quite turn out what I promised her. Thank you, gentlemen. So where are you in the storyline? Do you see a pattern? In the, in the people you wrote down or the stories you wrote down, do you see a pattern in it? What's, what's your pattern? Human interest, for my side, human interest and emotion. Excellent. From my dad and my grandfather. Excellent. Someone else? Humor. Humor. Human interest. Everyday. Everyday life. Excellent. What do you need to tell a great story? Do you need a, uh, do you need a stage? No? Most really great stories are told at barbecues and around kitchen tables. Do you need a microphone? Four score and seven years ago. I don't think so. I don't think Abe had a microphone. Do you need an audience? Audiences will come along. They're nice to practice on. What you need is material. Lots and lots and lots of material. I carry my fun book with me wherever I go. Every time I see, hear, think of something, I put it in the fun book. There isn't a day that I don't write something in here. If you're in Fort Collins and you're stopped at a light that turns green and you're sitting behind a Chrysler 300 and it's not moving, I'm not texting, I'm writing something in the fun book. All right? I'm the only guy on the planet that prays for a red light. If I, if I have a thought, I'm, please, please turn red so I can think about it and write it down. How many have had those brilliant thoughts? An idea? And what is the first thing you said to yourself? Oh, I'll remember that. And 30 minutes later, what are you doing? I should have written that down. Here's a small sample since I ran out of paper of my list of triggers, I call them. These are my story ideas. I write them down during the day, I go home at night, and I put them on the computer. 
always have a long list of material. Now the question is, where do you find great material? Randy, can I get you to hand out the next stack of papers? Not long ago at Loveland Toastmasters, we had a, when I was a member of the club, we had a young girl come in and she gave her icebreaker speech. And after she finished her icebreaker speech, she came and she sat down to me and she goes, right next to me, she goes, now what do I talk about? Are you kidding me? Look around. I mean, there are millions of stories everywhere. The next time September 11th rolls around and you're standing in a group of people, just say these simple words. Where were you that day? How many people will tell their story? Where they were on September 11th? Every single one of them. All right. Little audience help here. Give us, give everyone, share with everyone some places where you could find a great story. One of the things I always used to do is I think about the home I was raised in. Excellent. My bedroom, backyard. Memories. 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 National Enquirer. Ooh. <laughs> They're way over here on that end of that spectrum, aren't they? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, excellent. Did you ever hear the Paul Harvey story about the Vietnam Wall? The traveling wall years ago was coming across the country. And there was a lady that had written to a, a young man in Vietnam. And she'd written to him because her father was the colonel in the outfit. And she'd asked this kid had nobody to write to, nobody at home, nobody. So she wrote him letters. And after a while, the letters stopped. And so when the Vietnam War wall, the, the traveling wall, came through her town, she went to the wall to look for his name on it. And she couldn't find his name on the wall. So she, there were two sergeants guarding, one on either side of the wall. And she went to the one man. She said, I can't find a friend of mine's name on here. Could you help me? It was him. The man guarding the wall was the guy she'd written letters to. Who else? Why did he stop writing? You know, Paul didn't mention that. That's, that's a question in my mind. Like yeah, you, I'm sure he was transferred or something like that, but in the story, Paul didn't mention that. Who else? Where's some? In the supermarket, I like to make up stories about what other people have in their basket. <laughs> <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever encounter my two boys who used to play shopping for strangers where they'd walk by a cart and just put something in someone else's cart? <laughs> I'm sorry if that ever happened to anybody. Anyone else? Nikki. Yeah, I um, got a really good story that I did from my realtor. So I would say just in general, these are people that were talking to each other that were trying to keep from Ukraine. Oh, excellent. Absolutely, because everyone wants to tell their story. A good, good source for me was where, where I used to work. I used to inspect restaurants. And restaurant workers always have great stories. And all the people and things that happen. I grew up in a restaurant, and I have not told my wife any of those stories yet. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. This is like a setup. <laughs> Last year at the district conference, the fall conference, who was there? Craig Valentine. Who saw Craig Valentine speak? Do you remember his story about the first speech he gave after he won? Do you remember how he said how bad it was? He said, I rested on my laurels, and I, I gave them the worst speech I'd ever given in my life. He said, they paid me $3,500, and I gave them a $150 speech. He said, it was so bad that the limo driver didn't want to take me back to the hotel. <laughs> And when he finished, I was one of the ambassadors. I was standing out in the hall. It was just me. He finished, came off stage, went out into the hall. And I walked up and I said, Craig, was it that bad? He said, oh, it was awful. I said, come on, it couldn't have been that. Oh, it was, it was terrible. I said, did you feel bad? He said, oh, I felt horrible. 
I said, Craig, did you give the $3,500 back? He said, I did not. <laughs> there are stories everywhere. The next thing after you have all this wonderful material is to get comfortable with your material. What's the simplest story you can tell? Does anybody here not know a knock-knock joke? That's a story. A quote is a story. A pun is a story. A knock-knock joke is a story. They're simple. They're elegant. They have a beginning, middle, and end. You start small with storytelling. Years ago, there was a book. Uh, any golfers in the group? Any golfers? There was a book called How to Take Ten Strokes Off Your Golf Game. And the whole premise of this book is what do most golfers do when they go out to play golf? They go to the driving range, they get a bucket of ball, and they see just how far they can hit that little white ball. The premise of this book was where you start playing golf is that far from the hole. And then you get that far from the hole. And then you get that far from the hole. You're working your way up to the driving range. Storytelling is the same thing. You start small. You start with a small story, something in your life. That's why at Toastmasters we start with the icebreaker. It's about you. And then you can move up into telling stories about other people, your company, your business, your ideas. Start small, work your way up. I like to use what I call the 2468 rule. When you hear or see a story you like, you write it down longhand, not on the computer, two times. Longhand. Then you read it to yourself four times in your head. You hear what you, how you want to tell that story. Pauses, uh, inflection, you hear it four times. Then out loud, you say it six times using six different methods. However you want, you can, you can scream it out loud or you can whisper it. Practice it out loud six times. And then over the next two weeks, we're back to two, over the next two weeks, you tell eight people. And it can be anybody. It can be the person in the checkout aisle. It can be coworkers. Anybody. Unfortunately, my wife has to listen to all those stories all eight times. What is, what do most people, how do most people sabotage their self in storytelling? make themselves a hero. What do they say to themselves? Anybody ever heard this? I just can't tell a joke. I can never remember the punchline. Any others? Anybody think of any others that, that people tell themselves? Lots of times you'll get a speaker who says, I'm not a very good speaker. Self-fulfilling prophecy. I get up and walk out. Yep. <laughs> yeah, if that's their introduction, yeah. If they, if they don't think they're a good speaker. Why should you? Right. Absolutely. Nikki? I find with myself anyway that when I'm doing storytelling, if I don't, I don't do, and I like to keep for a You wander off, one of the wanderers. How many times have you heard prominent speakers like Zig Ziglar or Craig Valentine at a completely different conference or a completely different event, you'll, they'll tell the same story? Yes. They do that because it's a good story. They practice it. It's in here. They know it. And it becomes part of them. That's part of making a story, even, even if it's not your original story, to make that story about to, to get it inside you, to make it your story. Every one of the stories I sent Paul Harvey, even though that I'd taken weeks to write them and I thought they were perfect, he still tweaked it just a little bit. He made it his. He turned it into, he, even though he gave me the credit, he turned it into his story. He put his little twist on it.
story killers. Who's a giggler in the room? Who gets to laugh at their own story and can't tell it? Who's ever done this before a story, before you tell a story? This is the funniest thing you've ever heard. If it's the funniest thing you've ever heard, that may not be the funniest thing someone else has ever heard. Let your audience decide if it's a great story. Or I have a great story for you. Or I have to tell you. No, you don't. I mean, you can tell me the story, and, and I'll decide if I like it or not. But all that stuff sets you up for failure in storytelling. It's, it's the garbage around storytelling. Oh, yeah, and my favorite. Everyone finish this sentence. I guess you had. Or I guess you had to be. Yeah. Well, your job as a storyteller is to put them there. Randy, I am ready for the next set of handouts there. In place of saying this is the funniest story you've ever heard or this is the greatest story you've ever heard, launch right into your story. We have a natural tendency to try to set up the story. Just step into it. The other day, a friend of mine, last week, when I was at Toastmasters, launch, go right into it. Something that's not on there is about timing. There's two types of timing. There's the timing of the story, and there's timing when to tell the story. My youngest son used to come up to me and go, Dad, you know what the secret of a great story is? Timing. <laughs> you watch for the time to tell a great story. You don't just, if you saw an a amazing uh, accident on your way to work on Monday morning, the natural tendency is to run into work and tell what you saw. Why not think about that for a while and wait for the opportunity to tell that story? Think about what you thought when you saw it, the people involved, all the things around that that happened. Formulate the story. Because what you saw and what you think in your head when, when after you saw that accident and what you think will come out are two different things. I've heard storytelling called an art. I don't believe it is an art. I think it's a craft. It's deliberate, disciplined exercise involved around telling an event that happened. Put a smile in your voice. Why did we love Paul Harvey News? Because you could hear him smiling over the radio, right? You could hear it in his voice. He was like a friend telling you a story. The element of truth. No matter how much of a fable you're telling, there's always a little element of truth to it. I will tell you right now, there is a downside to being a great storyteller. Because once you become a great storyteller and you're known as a great storyteller, no one will ever believe anything you say again. <laughs> I could run into work Monday morning and say, the parking lot, there's five cars on fire in the parking lot, and there's actually five cars on fire, and no one's going to believe me. They call, that's so funny, it's so cute. Call the fire department. There's five cars out there for fire. No, really, what's, what's happening? No, there's five cars on fire. Show emotion. It's okay to tear up at a story. When you're, when you're talking about something that's, that is emotional to you and affects you, it's okay to show emotion. It's okay to embellish. John Maxwell tells a story about when he first have, started having grandchildren. And, he said, and his wife came to him and said, well, what, what are they going to call us? Mama, Papa, Grandpa, Grandma? And his wife said, well, I want them to call, the, I, I want them to call me Mimi, but I don't want them to call you Pee Pee. <laughs> now, I don't know if that story actually happened, but it's a great story. <laughs> and he probably embellished it a little bit, but that's okay. Make a story yours. Like I mentioned earlier, Paul Harvey, he took whatever story, and he, I'm sure he did this with everybody, he, made, he put his little spin on it, his little twist on it. We had a saying in my previous profession of photography as steel with both hands. That applies to storytelling just as it must, does to photography. Steel with both hands. Anytime you see, hear, think of something, if someone tells you something, it's okay to take that story and make it yours. Make it relative. 
If I was talking to a women's group, business women's group, and I wanted to come out and connect with them, I would tell them the story of that Fred Astaire, what's the old saying about Fred Astaire? Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, only backwards and in heels. Connect with your audience. Memorize it. If a story is worth telling, it's worth remembering. How many of you have mission statements at, at your work? Your company have a mission statement. How many of you can remember the mission statement? Bless you. I've been working for the same company for 12 years. I can't remember their mission statement. But I can remember something that was on my dad's desk when I was five years old. There's only two things to worry about. Whether you feel good or you feel bad. If you feel good, there's nothing to worry about. If you feel bad, there's only two things to worry about. Whether you're sick or you're not sick. If you're not sick, there's nothing to worry about. But if you're sick, there's only two things to worry about. If you're going to get better or you're not. If you get better, there's nothing to worry about. But if you don't, there's only two things to worry about. Whether you're going to go to the hospital or you're not. If you, go, if you don't go to the hospital, there's nothing to worry about. But if you go to the hospital, there's only two things to worry about. Whether you're going to live or you're going to die. If you live, there's nothing to worry about. But if you die, there's only two things to worry about. Well, you really don't have anything to worry about. If you go to heaven, you're nothing to worry about. And if you go to hell, you're going to have spend so much time talking with friends and relatives, you won't have time to worry. Now, that was on my dad's desk. I can remember that, but I cannot remember my company's mission statement. <laughs> explain, someone explain that to me. It's not, you know what it is? Do I believe it? Do I believe their mission statement? Malcolm Forbes said one time, if your company has a mission statement, you have too much time on your hands. I like Herb Kelleher's policy at Southwest Airlines. We don't have a mission statement. We have a philosophy. Do something. Avoid facts and figures. Not this last Ignite Fort Collins, but the one prior to that. I was one of the speakers at that. And there was a, a gentleman up there that gave, he had good intentions, but every one of his slides was filled with facts and figures and all these charts. I don't remember one thing from his presentation. I remember the guy that had chosen to cut off his own leg because he had problems from childhood with his leg. He had chosen to cut off his I remember him. I don't remember the guy with all the facts and figures. Use themes and metaphors. One of my favorite speakers is George Will. Now, George Will seems like a dry political commentator, but he tells the best stories. And usually they're about baseball. He relates politics to baseball, and people can see it. I can't read one of George Will's books because he's up here, but I can listen to him speak all day long. Involve the audience. Have we involved the audience today with questions? And they teach us that at Toastmasters. Involve the audience. Watch for feedback. Is it Ver I'm gonna Vernice. Vernice? Vernice, have a seat. When I was with Olin Mills, I started, I started to notice a little trend when I was posing people, and there were people in the room that were not the people. If like I was doing, so I was doing a, a grandmother, all right? And what I do is say, put both, both your feet on the floor, put your hands on your legs flat, sit up good and straight. How many of you felt yourself just sit up straighter? If you don't think you're, thank you. There will be a prize for you at the end. If you don't think your audience, I don't care if you're standing around the water cooler or the kitchen table or up in front of an audience, your audience is listening to you. They're watching what you do. And Toastmasters helps with that. Daniel Pink, uh, has anyone ever watched his YouTube? You seen the one about uh, true motivation? He comes out on stage and he immediately grabs people's attention by sharing a secret. And he says it like he's sharing a secret. I'm going to tell you something that my wife told me never to tell you. He says, as a part of youthful indiscretion, I'm not proud of this, but I went to law school. <laughs> he immediately captures the audience's attention. And then he sets about to make his case for, for true motivation based on legal, what he calls, I'm going to dust off some of my legal skills. Randy, the last handout, sir, if you would, please. Yes. Oh, 
There was your prize. I told you I didn't lie to you. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, I didn't pause for that. Just like Ed Tate earlier about his wife standing there, the, the, the nonverbals, Toastmasters teaches us to pause. A lot of people want to rush into a story and rush through a story to get to the punchline. Pause, inflection, some of the most important skills in storytelling. Here's a suggested list of some of what I think are some of the best speakers that you can watch and emulate. And each one of them have their own special little talent, special little gift. Again, Paul Harvey, his conversational tone, Johnny Carson. I don't care who you were, whether you were a, a seventh grader that had just won the National Spelling Bee or Bob Hope, when you sat down in that chair next to Johnny Carson, it was about you. It wasn't about him. And he got the best. He did that for 25 years and got the best out of people. And you may not consider him a storyteller, but I do. George Will, again, I mentioned. Les Brown. You know how they say not to laugh when you're telling a story? You know that? Les Brown breaks that rule. Les Brown gets so tickled at his stories that you can't help but laugh. He is so much fun to watch, and he breaks all the rules. Tom Peters. Anyone familiar with Tom Peters? Talks to you like he's letting you know if you don't do this in your business, you're going to fail. That's how he comes across. Zig Ziglar, Jerry Clower. Jerry Clower, if none of you are ever heard the southern humorous Jerry Clower, he makes a point in one of his stories about two things that are so important to storytelling. Know your material and be prepared. Now we all can agree that the oil industry had some very bad publicity lately. Exxon Valdez, the BP oil spill. So a group of Texas oilmen got together and they hired a professor out of A&M University who knew that every, he knew everything about the oil industry from conception to extraction. And they hired him to go around to university campuses and promote the oil business. Tell them the facts about the oil business. And so they hired this chauffeur to drive him around. And after about two weeks, the chauffeur looked in the rearview mirror at the professor and he said, Professor, life isn't fair. He said, what are you talking about, son? This is the greatest country on the face of this planet. This is America. You can be anything you want to be. He said, that may be true, but you're giving that speech, making a bunch of money, and I'm sitting here driving this limo for minimum wage. He said, and I'll tell you, I can give that speech better than you can. The professor said, is that right? He said, it is. He said, I tell you what, we're going to pull over up here, and we're going to change clothes. And tonight, this university that we're going to, they don't know me from Adam. And you're going to give that speech, and we'll just see how you do. Well, they changed clothes. They went to the university. And that night, when the chauffeur posing as a professor walked out on stage, he gave a speech that they'd never heard at that university. I mean, he had them rolling in the aisles. They were throwing their books in there. They gave him three standing ovations. It took the president of the university five minutes to calm the audience down. And when he did, he put his arm around the chauffeur and he said, you know, that was the greatest speech that's ever been given at this university. He said, I'm sure that there's someone in the audience who would like to ask you a question. <laughs> the young man in the front row, front row, pocket protector with 20 pens in it, horn rim glasses with tape in the middle, books under each arm. He stood up, he said, Professor, if a wildcat drill bit was to drill down through six atmospheres of pressure and hit a decaying carcass of a dinosaur, what would the pH of that soil be? And the chauffeur walked up to him. He said, son, he said, do you go to this university? He said, well, yes, sir, I do. He said, are you sure? He said, yes, sir. He said, I'm amazed that they would let someone in here that would ask such a stupid question. And to show you how stupid it is, my chauffeur's in the back row. He's going to answer it. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> I think he had a new job after that. <laughs> That's our time. Does anybody have anything that I can try to answer? Yes. Do you have any recommendations on structure?
sure like where we can learn about structures of stories, you know, obviously beginning, middle, and end, but it seems good stories maybe have logic, but there's some surprises. And well, your, your storytelling style is your storytelling style. And I, it's not complicated. Beginning, middle, end. And your, you will develop your style once you recognize what your storytelling style is. I mean, if you're an, if you're an engineer and telling engineer stories, that's your style. And don't complicate it. In storytelling structure, there's a couple of authors that are pretty good. Kendall Haven, Dr. Kendall Haven out of California, there's a couple of books on, on storytelling style. And also, storytelling text with Barbara Ellis has written a book about from uh, narrative to story, where, where she lays out storytelling style and its application. Thank you. Who's the second author? Barbara Ellis. Thank you. But we all, we all love telling our stories. We all want to tell our story. Yes, sir. Can I recommend one too? Absolutely. You, yeah, jump in. Book, there's a book called Stories uh, by a guy called Robert Lakeith. And he uh, trains Hollywood writers in the fundamentals of the story. Robert McKee. Yeah. Excellent. Michael Haig is another one that does something similar to Hollywood. Um, he reviews scripts and consults on movie projects. Okay. How many stories do you have? Do you have an idea? No. Hundreds. Couple hundred, yeah. And there, again, there's a downside to it. I want to give you an exercise over the next week. I want you to start paying attention to something you see, hear, feel, or think about. And then write it down, go through the 2468, think about it, and then look for the opportunity to tell that story. So is it better to learn this by watching with a good storyteller or learn the technique? Well, there's someone come up to me one time and paid me the, the best compliment I've ever had. They say, you tell stories like Paul Harvey. And I took that as a compliment. I mean, if you want to tell stories like Stephen Covey or, you know, stand-up comedians rob from each other all the time. They do. I mean, they, they steal material and, and patterns and style from, from their fellow comedians. Any others? But work on that, work on practicing your story. Pick five or 10 or how many ever stories that really affect you and work on them, practice them on people. I mean, you may never see the clerk at the, at the grocery store again, and it doesn't have to be a long-winded story, but look for the opportunities to tell and practice your stories. I would suggest that they go back to, to your clubs. Oh, absolutely. Go to the vice president of education. So we want to have a storytelling program where you just tell, you tell stories. You bet. You know one of the, one of the best places I've discovered for stories? You know at the end of a movie when you rent it and they have all that extra stuff? That's fabulous material. I mean, some of the stuff you get off of that. Who remembers uh, Marathon Man with Dustin Hoffman and Sir Lawrence Olivier? Gruesome movie. Sir Lawrence Olivier uses his dental skills to torture Dustin Hoffman. And when they were going around promoting that movie around the world, there was an English uh, interviewer that had the three of them up on stage, dark stage, just the three of them sitting there. And the interviewer was just totally enthralled with Dustin Hoffman's portrayal in that movie. He said, how did you look so bad? How did you get to that point? And Dustin Hoffman says, well, I didn't eat, I didn't sleep, I didn't bathe, I didn't shower, I abused my body, I did calisthenics. And Sir Lawrence Olivier looked at him, he said, or you could act. <laughs> and on that exercise about practicing your story, on people, the toughest thing, if you're in a group of people in an office and you tell your story, the hardest part of that will be to turn and walk away. When you get done, because I guarantee you, once you start telling the story, there'll be five other people that want to tell the story just the same. And the greatest compliment you can pay those people is to listen to their story. And I guarantee you, you will get stories from them as well. 
Thank you very much.